Let's begin with a prayer, to, shall we, to our Blessed Mother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To Thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To Thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn them, most gracious Advocate, Thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of Thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I just as uh, we'll do the Sacred Heart of Jesus each time, and I'm convinced <laughs> that by the end of the day, <laughs> everybody will have it right. <laughs> um, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of points that uh, occurred to me that I didn't get a chance to talk about last time with, as far as the development of scripture and thought. Uh, you know, oftentimes our Blessed Mother's uh, uh, journey to Elizabeth, uh, who was obviously pregnant with John the Baptist, uh, nobody in the day would have thought of that as the first Eucharistic procession, but that's exactly what it was. God made flesh. And that, of course, you know, you infer from that that our Blessed Mother at that point becomes a monstrance, because that's what she is. Her body is the first monstrance. And, uh, and nobody would have presumed at the moment something that develops out of that, but it's very important that the Holy Spirit inspires Luke to say that he had inspired uh, uh, Elizabeth, filled with grace, to blurt out, and why is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So, but nobody's sitting there right then at that instant going, oh, got it, okay, she's the mother of God. <laughs> but the church comes after some reflection. If so, for us, it's like, oh, yeah, of course she's the mother of God. But you can understand, without that necessary time to have that sort of reflection, how many people in the church would arrive at these horrible heresies. So you have you know, the, uh, you know, the Bishop Nestorius running around going, she's not the mother of God, she's just the mother of his human nature. Well, in one sense, thank you Nestorius for giving us the opportunity to actually go back to those original you know, documents and the prayers of the church and everything else, you know, 400 years after the actual events happen, and reflect on them and delve into them and say, ah, yes, not only is she the mother of God, she's also the queen of heaven. <laughs> because she's the mother of God and God's the king, and da -da. thank you. And again, while, there, while, that under, while that belief is always present, it's always present, the very fact that it finds its vocabulary and becomes developed in its expression, not developed in the belief, the belief is there, um, even with regard to purgatory. I was speaking with a uh, Protestant minister a, a, a very short while ago, and you know, I said something about purgatory, and he said, well, you know, ha-ha, you know, and, uh, but it kind of flies in the face of the lived experience of the church. There's nothing in the, you know, that when the second book of Maccabees, well, when Luther tosses out the, the seven books of the Bible, one of them he tosses out is the second book of Maccabees, and the second book of Maccabees is scriptural proof that there's a purgatory. Uh, you know, nothing in there, uh, you know, Protestants and Catholics both believe it is the er inerrant word of God, uh, we part company on who gets to interpret it. Uh, since the church put it together and canonized it, we do, but, uh, which is why Luther recognized that and had to get rid of the second book of Maccabees because it says right there, right there, it is a good and wholesome thing to pray for the dead that they might be loosed from their sins. It says it right there. And uh, so Luther can't have that because remember what starts him off is the whole you know purgatory indulgences thing and all that so he throws the baby out with the bathwater a lot of things that Luther said were absolutely spot on but he then went too far with them uh, but you have something like you know now we have the the doctrine of purgatory now of course yes the word purgatory isn't in the Bible it doesn't Trinity isn't in the Bible Jesus's two wills aren't in the Bible the uh, uh, the um, uh, you know, the end of the apostolic age isn't in the Bible. Of course the end of the apostolic age isn't in the Bible. How could St. John write, everything's good until I die? 
And then that's it, sealed, locked, and forever. I'm not dead yet. I mean, he, unless he was sitting there with a quill in his hand and writing the end and keeled over dead, it couldn't possibly be the case. So, but we all accept that. There are many things from the tradition of the church that even our Protestant brothers and sisters accept without realizing that in accepting those things, you are accepting the authority of the church who proclaimed them. So it isn't a question of, yes, I accept the authority or, I'm, or I don't. It comes down to a question of, do I accept all of the authority or do I, don't, or do I not? And you cannot logically accept the authority based on itself Sometimes. You can't have that. It, it doesn't make sense. Because if you're willing to cede that the authority is the authority, then you can't say, oh, unless, of course, I disagree with it. Which is sort of at the heart of, the, it's the heart of Protestantism. And a lot of the truths that Protestants proclaim, uh, matter of fact, all of the truths that Protestants proclaim are first Catholic truths. You know, it was from the church that the uh, Protestant reformers have the idea that God is three persons in one God. That's not a Protestant thing, it's a Catholic thing. Um, it's just which of the list of Catholic things that they decide to keep and which ones they decide to get rid of. Um, but specifically with regard to purgatory, um, you know, the Jews believed in not the place called purgatory, but what the word is doesn't matter. What they believed in was the concept that after death, there was a purging that happened. That was always the case, even if you threw out the second book of Maccabees and said, nope, it's not scriptural uh, like Luther did. Nope, it's not real. It still, as a historical document, expresses the truth of what the Jews did believe. Even if you say, okay, well, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't inspire that, it's not true, it is still a historical fact that the Jews did believe this. And we just happen to know that since it's in the Bible, it's a historical fact that they believe that was also revealed to them, uh, you know, through the course of their, uh, their time as being the chosen people. But uh, we also have, the, so, you know, the apostles were all Jews. It would have been nothing. It wouldn't have even occurred to their minds for apostles to sit around and think, oh, wait a minute, you know, there's a, there's a place you go after you die that you might not be perfect. They already believe and knew that and accepted that, as did their fathers and their grandfathers and great-grandfathers all the way back. They all believed that. So when Jesus is talking about, you know, you will not be let out until the last penny is paid, that doesn't ring to them as weird. It makes perfect sense from everything they believe. Which is why, as you sort of uh, uh, move along from, you're transported from the old covenant to the new, and the life of the new Israel, the church has taken all of these truths with it. So that right there, just 30 years after the, uh, less than 30 years after the ascension of our blessed Lord to heaven, you have in the catacombs, uh, you know, under the, near Rome, you have the catacombs, you know, hundreds of prayers for the dead. People who had died, uh, had left instructions that to be written on their walls, carved in, pray for me. You know, well, what am I praying for you for? You're either, if, if there's no purgatory, you're either in heaven or hell. If you're in heaven, my prayers don't help you. If you're in hell, tough luck, they don't help you either. <laughs> so what am I praying to you for? So it's already this common accepted practice and has always been that way. It's always been that way, and to sort of hang, just wrap up the thought on the sort of the continuity of Catholic teaching and the continuity of Catholic practice and understanding. Uh, when my mother died in 2004, right smack there on her tombstone uh, is, say a Hail Mary for us. Because, it's just, you know, that's the exact same thing the Catholics did 2,000 years ago in the catacombs in Rome. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed except our, our, the depth of how we understand things now. Uh, and the fact that the word purgatory was attached to this state of purgation is, who cares? You know, it, I mean, the word doesn't mean anything. It, it just refers to kind of the collected knowledge of what we have, and we have to give it some word, or we can just keep calling it, well, this place where you, this state of being in which you, well, you know, we don't want to keep saying, you know, 75 words, so we just give it a title. And we don't want to keep saying, you know, the, you know the, our Lord is, you know, truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, uh, you know, under the appearance of, of uh, you know, bread and wine, we just say transubstantiation. And we can just abandon that vocabulary if you like, but come up with a better one first. And that's all it is.
So as we talk about the, uh, move into our second topic here, who's in charge here anyway, the hierarchy and authority within the church, this becomes kind of the central problem, the central issue uh, with Protestants and Catholics. Who's in charge? This is also an issue with faithful Catholics and lousy Catholics. <laughs> Who's in charge? Um, so let's first talk for a moment about uh, the uh, problem as stated with regard to Protestants. Who's in charge? Clearly somebody must be in charge. Clearly. You have heresies that have to be challenged. They have to be uh, defeated and they have to be explained and gone over and all. So who's doing that work? Well, somebody has to do that work, obviously, and somebody has to have the final decision, the final arbiter of whatever it is you're talking about. That's with regard to heresies. Likewise, somebody has to have the final authority with regard to uh, the non-heretical side, but just the teachings of the church. What does this mean? Uh, how do we explore this more in depth? Uh, how do we appreciate the beauty of this in a more deep fashion? Somebody has to be the kind of arbiter on that also, sort of the guide. Uh, and our Lord uh, provided for that. Our blessed Lord provided for that in the person of the apostles and their successors. And, uh, and of course he would. If he didn't provide for that, it would be manifestly unjust, and God cannot brook un injustice in himself. He is justice. He doesn't have justice, he is justice. And it would be manifestly unjust for him to give to the apostles what they needed as far as authority, and knowing that when he gives them the, that authority, uh, all of a sudden, in proximity, you know, well, you count John, 70 years at the absolute limit, uh, that they're all going to be dead. Well, he established his church, I think most even Protestants would agree with this, that he established the church to continue, you know, in perpetuity until he returns. So knowing that we would at least be at this point, unless we walk out of here at lunchtime and it's the end of the world, yay. Um, <laughs> uh, that would be... If you're all in a state of grace, that's a great thing. <laughs> um, if the, uh, I mean, it'd be manifestly unjust. So all of a sudden, so everybody who was physically there right then, who was able to hear the apostles talk, but when they die, that's it, you're kind of on your own. Well, how unfair is that? And with each successive generation that moves down, because the truth was located, the locus of the truth was in that first century, that would therefore mean that if it doesn't continue, the further and further and further out in time you go, the farther you are away from the truth. How manifestly unfair is that of God? And when you trace down the history as it unfolded, um, you, know, I, I, you know, many, many Protestants have a great love for what they understand the scriptures to be and how they understand our Lord. Good, that's a great starting point, but it is not the end. Even we haven't arrived at the end. We have, as the church, the mystical body of Christ on earth, the fullness of truth. But each one of us as individuals has still yet to arrive at that point. We have it available to us. We have it available to us in our liturgical uh, lives, our devotional lives, our intellectual lives as you know, regard the church. Uh, but we as individuals haven't arrived at that point yet. You know, we've got a bank account sitting over here with trillions of dollars in it. And we've all got, by virtue of our baptism and our confirmation and being in a state of grace, we've all got the ATM card to that account. So go draw it out. But we will never be able to deplete the account. But what Protestants have, to follow up on that analogy, is access to some of the funds in that account, but they put their card in and sometimes it doesn't work. And other times they put it in and they're able to get some of it, but they didn't get all of it. And there's, there's a disconnect, not because they're evil-minded or anything. That's not the issue. 
The issue is they don't have access to all of it because they deny the access to it. They don't rely on the card. They rely on themselves. Now, they're not going to say, no, no, we have scripture, scripture. No, 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 no. The scripture is part of the card, but you have determined what the card means. It's not up to you to determine what the card means. When the bank gives you your ATM card, it doesn't let you program the magnetic strip on the back. It hands it to you as an objective reality. You put this in, and here is the PIN code you will put in, or you do not have access. It's not your money until you plug into it and take it out. And here's the means by which you can do that. Now, Catholics have this same thing in a different way. Catholics who go up to receive the body and blood of our Lord at Holy Communion have missed the boat quite often when they go up and receive, first of all, if they are in a state of grace, that is infinite grace, infinite. Every single time we approach the altar for Holy Communion, it is infinite grace because it is Jesus Christ himself. Not limited, not you know, circumscribed in any way, limited one million, billion, trillion percent, fully, infinitely, God. And yet we are able to walk up there and receive practically nothing of the grace because of our disposition, not because of the grace. The grace is always there. It's always a tremendous tidal wave and typhoon of grace coming down. And yet we just open the window a little crack and let some of the storm come in. Or we go running out real quick with a big umbrella over our head. So you get a little bit of wet maybe on our feet, but that's it. And then, of course, there are the Catholics who are not disposed to go up and receive Holy Communion, uh, as St. Paul warns, and they eat and drink their own damnation. St. Paul's very, very serious on that point. You'll find it in his letter to the Corinthians. Very, very serious on that point. That... Even back then, when he's writing his letter to the Corinthians, remember, Paul is martyred somewhere in the early 60s, uh, 63, 64, somewhere in that time frame in Nero's persecution in Rome. And uh, this is no more than 30 years after our Lord has ascended to heaven. No more, probably less. And even then, even then, the significance of the Eucharist and what it means uh, is explicitly laid out to the Corinthians. You are guilty of the murder of the Lord if you do not discern the body and the blood. If you eat the bread and drink the wine without discerning, you are guilty of the murder of the Lord. How could you possibly be guilty of the murder of God if the worst thing you're doing is kind of lazily strolling up and not really paying attention and just grabbing you know, a piece of Wonder Bread? or some matzah, as it would have been back then. What, what could you be doing? What's so horrible about that? You're going, to be, you're going to be damned because you kind of ate some bread carelessly? Because it's not bread, as St. Paul's point. So, but how do we know that? How do we know that? When our Lord says at the Last Supper, when he turns to them and says, turns to the apostles and says, do this in memory of me, that isn't a you know, sort of a command to just, you know, hey, think of me when you're doing this, like you're flipping through a photo album. At a Jewish uh, liturgical event, which this was, this dinner was, uh, the Last Supper was, when Jews invoked, back, and still do today, when they invoke in their prayer a sense of memorial, a sense of memory, it isn't memory in the sense of, oh, remember what happened 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. It means make those events present to us today. Make them come alive again. Take us to them. Unite us to them in the here and the now. 
It's not a memorial like Veterans Day or Labor Day or something like that where we stand around and remember and read off the roll of names. It's being back at Normandy fighting with the troops. It's being back on Bunker Hill fighting in the revolution. That's what the Jewish understanding is of do this in memory of me, make this a memorial. And when Jews talk about a memorial, they talk about it comes back to this that we are made present again to the historical events. But if you don't have that understanding, and where did that understanding come from? It came from the whole Jewish tradition. Who was sitting there at the Last Supper? Jesus, Jewish. The apostles, Jewish. When Jesus says to the apostles, do this in memory of me, they're not thinking, hey, somebody take out their uh, iPhone and take some pictures of this so we can look at it five years from now. They're thinking exactly what our blessed Lord means, which is this event here becomes enshrined. And why does our Lord do this? Why does our blessed Lord take this moment and tell them how he wants it done? He didn't do that with circumcision. He knew that circumcision was going to come up as an issue in a couple of years. Never said a word about it in advance. But this moment, he told them not only what to do, but how to do it. Because he did not want to leave this supreme moment in the hands of fallible human beings who would most assuredly mess it up. Because this is the very moment of bread and wine being transformed, transubstantiated into himself so that for all of time, we, no matter what time, culture, place we're in, in human history, will be taken back to the sacrifice of Calvary, that we stand there at the foot of the cross, not just in our memories, but in our reality. That's why the Mass is called a sacrifice. And it's not that we repeat the sacrifice over and over and over again. It's that we are all drawn back to the one sacrifice. This is the supreme moment of love. With regarding love, it surpasses the resurrection. We get to participate in the resurrection on the last day. Here, we get to participate in Christ in him, physically, in him, now. And a touchstone to what happens on Calvary. And that moment he wants preserved and us to have access to it and a touchstone to it for all of his followers throughout all of time. It's more important than the incarnation. It's more important than the resurrection. It's more important than any other thing that happens. For this reason he came into the world. We all come into this world to live. As Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, he came into the world to die. And that death, that moment, becomes the defining, life-giving moment for us. And he does it out of pure love, and he wants us to have access to that love. So it is not just a memorial in the sense that we understand in modern terms the term memorial. It is not a memorial day. It is a bringing back to life those events that we are brought back, sucked back in a time machine 2,000 years back to Calvary. Now that varies dramatically with how Protestants understand what happened at the Last Supper. They can't both be right. They can't both be right. One is either very right and the other very wrong, or the other is very wrong and the other one is very right. They can't both be right. There is not room, as Gary Cooper would say, in this town for both of us. <laughs> These two understandings of what happened in that upper room are at contradiction to each other. They cannot be reconciled with each other. So how do you know which one is right? Well, I suppose you go to the people who were there and ask them, what was it that happened in that room? When our blessed Lord on Easter Sunday day is sidling up to the two disciples 
on the road to Amos and makes that wonderful vortex-like comment, how <laughs> slow of mind and dull of heart you are. <laughs> See, there's precedent for the vortex. <laughs> when he makes that comment and he start, you know, they don't, they're getting it, but they're not. They understand sort of, but they're not sure. They can't, it's only, only when he vanishes from their sight. Ah, and we understood him, recognized him in the breaking of the bread. How did those two folks, we know who one of them was, his name is mentioned, but the other person, we don't know who that was. It doesn't say the name of the second person. We have no idea who, who it is. And yet somehow, this is Sunday, our blessed Lord does this the first time on Thursday night, so we've got Friday and all the events of Good Friday, and then we have Saturday and all the ugh of Saturday, and then they get up Saturday and go, it's over, let's head on off. How did they know? Well, we know one of them wasn't at the Last Supper because he wasn't one of the apostles. So how did they know just two days later? It wasn't like the, you know, as soon as Good Friday was over, the apostles like all, you know, ran around and said, well, let's say Mass now. Peter's, you know, Judas is hanging from a tree. Peter's over there crying his eyes out and, you know, great, horrible, I can't believe I've done this. But one of those, the unnamed one, did know. And he got it. And more than that, because it was the Eucharist, and they, as said, were not our hearts burning inside of us. They were open to the truth. So, as we talked about in the first conference, as the truth became more and more and more revealed to them, when it finally shone forth in its fullness, they understood and they believed. But if Jesus were to have just stood there right on the road and said to them, what are you guys all upset about? Well, we sort of thought he would be the one. Oh, here I am, see, here's my nail wounds. But he wants, to, he wants them to understand at a deeper level than that. And so they go rushing back to Jerusalem, you know, imagine tearing down the road, and then they run into the upper room, kick the door open, and they're all like, hey, we've seen the master! We've seen the master! Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, we know, he appeared to Peter earlier. It was a bit of a letdown, but... Um, and then he appears to all of them. And he says something most remarkable. Again, something that, that our Protestant brothers and sisters miss because they're not tied into the original tradition in its completeness. There are two Pentecosts for the church. There is the public Pentecost that happens uh, nine days after our Lord's ascension to heaven. But there is this private Pentecost that happens on Easter Sunday night. Jesus appears to them there. Now, the guys have come running back in from Emmaus. Peter's there, yes, I've seen him. John's like, I believe, I looked in the tomb, I saw. Mary Magdalene came in, we didn't believe her at first, but now she is, and some of the women, she's told some of them, and, they're, and then all of a sudden, you know, strike up the you know, angelic choir, oh, there's Jesus. Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Stop there. As the Father sent me, so I send you. How did the Father send our Lord? He sent him into the world to suffer. He sent him into the world to deliver the good news, to forgive sins, and to make sure that they understand this. He says immediately on the heels of that, Receive the Holy Spirit. That's the first Pentecost. And they are charged with what to do at that Pentecost. These aren't just friendly sounding mystical devotionally words. They are marching orders. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you hold bound, they are held bound. He gives them his own authority to forgive sins. And not just like, oh, it's okay, what you did to me the other night, that's, no, I, I forgive it. No. Who sends, as the Father sent me, so I send you. 
and he breathed on them. And the only other time that breathed word is used, that original Greek word, is when God breathed life into Adam. It's the only time. He makes a new creation. He makes a new man. And this new man is his own body, the mystical body of Christ. He breathes into them. Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed into them life, Adam and Eve in the garden. He breathes into them supernatural life in the upper room. But that supernatural life is not just for themselves. It's for everyone they come into contact with. Everyone. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven you. I, they are forgiven them. I give you my own divine authority to forgive sins. And Simon, you'll remember, up there in Caesarea Philippi, I said, I will build my church on you and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now there is a uh, bit of a controversy among uh, various Protestants about the exact events that transpired and the exact language being used by our blessed Lord up in uh, uh, Caesarea Philippi. Uh, it's important whenever you find something in Holy Scriptures that, that uh, gets into a little bit of detail. Well, the Holy Spirit wrote the scriptures. He wrote them obviously through the agency of men, but he inspired them. Nothing is in there uh, that doesn't have a point. So why does the Holy Spirit care that we know that this happened at Caesarea Philippi? Could have happened in Jerusalem, couldn't it? No, as a matter of fact, if you look at a map of ancient, uh, ancient Israel, Caesarea Philippi is an area rather kind of out of the way. You have to sort of make a specific journey to go there. And there was at Caesarea Philippi a great big monstrous sheer mountain, sheer rock wall. And on the top of that was a temple built to false gods. And there are little niches carved out all over the side of this big gigantic, you know, hundred foot brick uh, stone rock wall. And inside here were little statues and amulets to all different gods and this and that. And at the bottom of the, the wall, there's this big sort of uh, cavern. And there's water bubbling up from under that cavern. And that water is the headwaters of the Jordan River. And it was believed by some that underneath and below those headwaters were the gates of hell. That that's how you got to hell. So... This region had become known as uh, uh, the, uh, the, the palace of the Caesars, the, the, where royal authority resided, Caesarea, Caesar. And it had been that way for hundreds of years. This was a very impressive geographical feature. So Jesus takes the apostles up there, takes his apostles to this particular region, dedicated to the kings and the rulers, the kind of ecclesiastical authorities, uh, where the headwaters of the Jordan River, which keep Israel alive, water in the desert, where the gates of hell are down there below those waters, and sets up poor little Simon, Simon Bar-Jonah, which is Jewish for son of John, which in English would be Johnson. So the first, pope's, the first pope's name was Simon Johnson. And <laughs> so he says to Simon, you are Peter the rock. This rock with its temple on it means nothing. You are the rock. And on this rock... I will build my temple. That temple on that rock will go away. I will build my temple, my church on you, the rock. And I will give to you. Now, back up a second. Lots of problems say, well, he says rock. It really means pebble. And, you know, he uses the Koine Greek, but it's really the Attica Greek. And da, 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 da. Well, that would be fine if that, you could have that discussion if it was the only thing our Lord said. But it isn't the only thing our Lord said. 
You can't just pull half a sentence out of context and then deliver a whole sort of diatribe on it. He says to, if he was just talking about Peter's faith, which many Protestants have to argue that, you're either talking about the man or his faith, because what precedes this? Jesus saying, who do people say the Son of Man is? And, you know, they say, oh, John the Baptist back from the dead, Elijah, blah, blah, blah. And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And our blessed Lord says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for not flesh and blood has revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So Peter is singled out by God the Father. Jesus affirms that and says, uh, but my Father in heaven, and moreover, for my part, as the second person of the blessed Trinity, I say unto you, you are Peter the Rock. He changes his name, like he changes Abraham's name, Abram's name, uh, uh, and makes him the head. But then he goes on to tell him what he is to do as the head. It isn't just his faith. That is an interpretation of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, which falls flat on its face because of the very next line. I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You can't give a concept authority. Authority must be exercised in person by a person. No concept has authority. Justice doesn't have authority. Justice must be exercised by a person, and that's where the authority comes from. So here we have uh, the authority being given to a person. And to you I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, Jesus is Jewish. The apostles are Jewish. They would have had a tremendously awesome understanding of their own Jewish scriptures, as everybody did back in the day. When Jesus starts talking about kingdom, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. When he starts using phrases like kingdom, keys, this all of a sudden evokes in them the account we have in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, where God the Father says, I will take the keys away from you, an unjust leader of the Jewish, uh, of the people in the temple, and I will take that key and I will place it on him. And what he bind, and what he closes, no one shall open. And what he opens, no one shall shut. And he shall be as a father to his people. God handing the keys of Jerusalem over in the book of Isaiah, which is, remember, the kingdom of Israel, the earthly kingdom of Israel, is a precursor. It's a foreshadowing of the kingdom of heaven. It's the Davidic kingdom. The Davidic kingdom, while it comes in time before uh, the, kingdom of, uh, the kingdom of the church, it is a precursor because the kingdom of the church actually exists before it. So it, the kingdom of the Davidic kingdom, like the first talk, is kind of a, a revealing, a slow revealing of the reality of what's to come. So God gives the ruler in Jerusalem the keys of the kingdom. And he gives Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven and invests him with his authority. We have a third example of this happening. We have it in uh, Caesarea Philippi. We have it there in Isaiah. And then we have it in uh, John chapter 20, uh, 21, where Peter is there, probably feeling very awkward Go back sort of to the reality of what is the, the historical reality, the human experience of what's captured in the uh, words and the words of men and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the Gospels, particularly in John. How weird must Peter have felt? They really think about this. He loves our Lord tremendously. He loves our Lord so much so that he kind of loves him with like a reckless abandon and sticks his foot in his mouth all the time and, uh, and then regrets it. And, but, you know, it, it's that kind of, you know, puppy running around at your feet that loves you and kind of like keeps bumping into things and tripping and maybe dribbles on your foot a little. He just can't kind of control himself. And you can call me out of the boat. You know, and Jesus is like, okay, come on out of the boat. And the other apostle is like, are you nuts? Get back in here. 
And Peter's just like, I'm getting out of the boat. He gets out of the boat. And all of them denied Jesus. Now, granted, his denial is noted specifically, you know, in the, the cock crows three times. Uh, or you deny me three times. Uh, and that, so that's noted specifically. But it's, they all denied him. But Peter is the one weeping bitterly over it because he loved him so intensely that even in himself, his betrayal is just almost too much to live with. So here's Jesus standing there with them multiple times. He appeared, he all, we know he appeared to Peter individually on Easter Sunday. We hear that in the Gospel of Luke. He appeared to him privately. We know nothing about the content of that, uh, uh, that appearance of our Lord, except that it happened. Uh, we know that he appeared later on that night, and Peter was there with the other apostles, minus Tom, Thomas, Tom, Thomas, um, Tommy. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, he appeared at the Sea of Galilee. He's appeared multiple times. How kind of weird do you think Peter must have felt? It's like, oh, Jesus! Yeah, that's right. I uh, got that whole denial thing going on. Well, he hasn't really brought it up, so maybe things are okay. <laughs> he hasn't really said anything about it. And when he looks at me, though, I still do feel that kind of thing. Oh, go on. It's just, well, so I can't really look him quite in the eye. I'm glad he's here, but I'll like, rush around and make fish dinner for him. <laughs> and so our Lord apparently lets that go on, or does let that go on for a little bit, and then says, uh, right in the middle of everything, with other apostles there as a public witness, and that's important. That would make sense why our Lord did not say anything to him about this when he appears to him privately on Easter Sunday morning or sometime during Easter Sunday day. Uh, doesn't say anything to him then because Peter's denial was public and his recanting would have to be public. And so he says to him, Peter, uh, oh, notice how he addresses him too. He calls him Simon, son of John. He calls him Peter the entire time up, in, you know, up to Matthew 16 changes his name to Peter, and from henceforth calls him Peter. All of a sudden, he's sitting here at the seaside, having you know, made fish for them, that Peter dove out of the boat when John says, it is the Lord. Boom, dives into the water, swims there. I love you, I love you. Oh gosh, here's that awkward moment again. <laughs> We've got to get rid of this awkward moment. I want to be here, but I always feel stupid, and blah, 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 blah. So he's sitting there, and you know, he, Jesus must have a sense of humor. <laughs> And, he, uh, and at that moment, he turns to him, and he does not call him Peter. He says, Simon, son of John. That's what he called him before he made him the leader of the apostles. So yes, there's been a rupture in the relationship that needs to be healed. And this is going to be very awkward for you, Simon, son of John, but we need to get the cards out on the table. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Oh, well, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And what does he say? Feed my sheep. You don't feed sheep. You just open the corral and let them go out and eat the grass themselves. You don't bring food to sheep. You take them to the food. So they're all sitting there. Must have been a really awkward moment. Not only for Peter, but imagine the other disciples. You're like, oh, I'm going to go over and um, I'm going to go scale some fish. <laughs> They're all sitting there cracking jokes and having fun. It's wonderful to be here. Jesus, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Uh-oh. Or Scooby-Doo would say, rut row. <laughs> and he answers. Okay, so that awkward moment's out of the way. Okay, we're done with that. This is very good. It's nice fish. It's very nice to pass the paprika. <laughs> Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Oh, now let's really ratchet up the awkwardness now. <laughs> yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter becomes exacerbated at this point. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. You know all things. Feed my lambs. Or, sorry, tend my sheep. And I tell you solemnly, when you were young, 
you put on your loins and sandals and went wherever you wanted to. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your arms and someone will tie you fast and take you where you do not want to go. And John, in writing that gospel, by the time he wrote that gospel, knew that Peter had already been crucified upside down by Nero in the circus on Vatican Hill. And so makes the point, steps out of the narrative to say, and in this fashion or in this manner, Jesus predicted the way in which Peter would give glory to God. And then he steps back into the narrative. It would be a horrible thing if the authority given to Peter to feed the sheep ended on Vatican Hill in the year 64. 1950 years later, we'd be starving. How do we know the truths? You cannot leave the truths of Almighty God to the caprice of men. I will send you the Holy Spirit and he will lead you to all truth. The Holy Spirit cannot contradict himself. He cannot contradict himself. He cannot give false truths. He cannot present something that is in contradiction to itself. Our Lord established one church. It's incorrect to refer to anything other than the Holy Roman Catholic Church in union with Peter and his successors to refer to that as a church. Pope Benedict himself makes that clear. He said they are most, uh, most, most more favorably referred to as ecclesial communions. But even among these various ecclesial communions, there are vast differences of opinion. Because when you leave something to the, to the caprice of sinful men, you are going to automatically, guaranteed, end up with division. You must end up with division. If it is nothing more than a matter of my opinion on what this passage means versus your opinion versus your opinion, and that's it, how do we ever know the truth? And every one of us is claiming the Holy Spirit is guiding me. And every one of us is claiming that the Holy Spirit put it on my heart. <laughs> no, the Holy Spirit did not put it on. A spirit put that on your heart, but it was not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> there is a line that is uh, disturbing and frightening in its, uh, when you really stop to consider it and draw all the inferences from it. There are many lines like that in the gospel, but one in particular we talked about in the last one when our blessed Lord is at Capernaum and he is talking about his real presence. And he finally says, eat my flesh. And I'm not going to get into the whole you know, uh, uh, exegesis of all that. The church has always taught that, always believed it. The apostles believed it. Everybody believed it. It was never ever a doubt or question until Martin Luther came along 1,500 years uh, earlier, uh, later. Uh, there was a debate uh, uh, between two monks um, in the 9th and 10th centuries over what exactly it meant to be the body of Christ. And they started breaking down this discussion. Well, does that mean you're like eating his muscle tissue and his sinews and like cartilage? And that kind of discussion began. And anyway, eventually got uh, somebody, one of the guys ventured off into some heresy and the Pope corrected him. And interestingly enough, when Pope Paul VI, in 1970, I believe, published an uh, instruction on uh, the Blessed Sacrament, uh, a, a treatment of the Blessed Sacrament, um, he quoted what the Pope had said a thousand years earlier. He lifted those words and pulled them forward and said, what was true then is true now, a thousand years later. So, so much for the, uh, to talk about the continuity of church teaching. Um, but while everybody is denying and getting up and walking away, notice our blessed Lord doesn't try to stop them. He doesn't say, oh, no, 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 you misunderstood me. Uh, no, no, you haven't gotten it right. Oh, you slow of mind, dull of heart, dullard, sit down. Let me really explain to you what I mean. He'd just done that multiple times over and over, and they rejected it. 
And then he turns to the apostles, you know, Peter, again, not fully understanding, uh, says, you know, well, if you say it, Lord, it's worthy of belief. You have the words of everlasting life. To whom else would you, where would we go? And Jesus says a couple of things. And then he says, looking at the apostles, one of you is a devil. It's how that passage ends. Now, we never seem to hear that. Uh, you know, most, most times we're hearing that in, the, in Mass, that particular gospel passage ends with, you know, the reading on Sunday ends with, you know, two or three sentences earlier. It doesn't advance to, uh, but one of you is a devil. When our Lord is betrayed by Judas on the night of the Last Supper, on Holy Thursday night, at the Last Supper, remember that at the Last Supper, while Jesus is there instituting the priesthood, uh, uh, making himself sacramentally present under the appearance of bread and wine, instructing them that he wants this done for you know, time and memoriam, that Satan enters Judas's heart at that very moment. And for, not for nothing, but uh, we hear that he went out and it was night. He went out into the darkness. He went out into the darkness because he would not accept the truth of the Eucharist. More so, he had already rejected our Lord in the Eucharist at Capernaum two years earlier. One of you is a devil. Not one of you will become a devil. Not you all kind of believe right now. You're not really quite sure what I'm talking about. But once it becomes clear, 11 out of the 12, you'll get it right. No. One of you is a devil. Lucifer, uh, Judas um, didn't believe then. His betrayal of our blessed Lord happened in his heart outside the synagogue in Capernaum. He merely carried it out to its logical extent two years later as he left the upper room. The one thing Father John Harden said, we can argue about our Blessed Mother and purgatory and papal infallibility and all the rest of it all we want, but the one thing that separates Protestants from Catholics more than anything else is the Eucharist. And anybody who is a serious Catholic needs to work on that one issue. Need to explain, understand what the significance of this is. St. Thomas Aquinas calls the Eucharist the bread of angels. But the angels cannot receive it. They may tend to it, they may worship it, but they may not receive it. We can. Lucifer hates the Eucharist because embodied in the Eucharist is all of salvation, all of it, which is why Pope John Paul II Blessed John Paul II quotes Pope Paul VI, who quotes previous popes all the way back to who knows when, 1,000, 1,500 years earlier, that the Eucharist is the source and summit of the faith. It is the source and summit of all of salvation is there. I will put hatred between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Well, where does the offspring what does that mean? Who does she give birth to? She gives birth to God in the flesh. And there he is on Catholic altars, continually, every day, 365 days a year, seven days a week, blah, 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 right there. They'll put hatred between you and the woman. The same flesh that laid in the manger, Bethlehem, by the way, for those of you who don't know, means house of bread, was laid in a manger, is the same flesh that was crucified on the cross, the same flesh that rose out of the grave, is the same flesh we receive at Holy Communion. Why wouldn't it be? If you're going to be discussing these things, and you should be, that's not a suggestion. <laughs> Yours and my salvation depends on telling people the truth. 
if Jesus could love us that much, that he could make himself present to us under the appearance of bread and wine, why wouldn't he? Of course he would. Nobody who loves restricts their love, who truly loves. Nobody. You want to be with the person as much as you possibly can, and when you can't, there's an ache. Thank God they invented texts. Before that, it was sticky notes. How horrible it would have been 300 years ago when you physically left the presence of somebody, that was it. Until you were physically back in their presence again, that was it. Maybe a letter that took months to get to you. You didn't even know when you were reading it if the person who wrote it to you was alive still. They might have been dead that much time. When you left the presence of someone, it was horrible. There was no constant thing like there is now. There were no such things as photographs. I've seen that kind of notice that weird thing in kind of the American culture. I don't mean just in our borders, but the America. It never really seems like when somebody's dead, somebody famous is dead, that they're actually dead. I mean, Lucille Ball still cracking things up with, you know, you know, Vivian Vance and, you know, and, you know, Lucy. I mean, they all seem like they're still kind of alive. But a hundred years ago, they weren't. And when you died a hundred years ago, you died. That was it. You're gone. You know, few people that knew you in the village, maybe remembered you for a few years, had a couple happy memories, and they died, and that was it. You were gone. Wiped out from human history, from any memory of anything. A very small handful of people would have known somebody famous when they died, a king, a queen, something like that. Aside from that, we're all forgotten souls. And we shouldn't pretend that with the exception of an occasional you know, videotape or voice recording or something like that, that this won't be our lot a hundred years from now. Not one of us sitting here in this room will anybody know anything of a hundred years from now. Only God. But anybody here on earth, you know, knows. They'll flip through some picture, some picture album. When my mom and dad were moving out here, my mom saw this uh, gentleman who'd kept all in her building in New York, had kept stacks and stacks and stacks of all of these photos of, you know, that he loved his wife dearly, she had some horrible disease, and anyway, kept all of these things and used to visit with my mom. He'd go pull out all these pictures all the time and show her, oh, let me show you pictures. I think her name was Sophia, uh, Sophia, da, da. And I was, anyway, he died and uh, they didn't have any children. So the people, the, the executor of the will uh, had gone into the room, my, the apartment, and my mom saw them. And they just took all, she just saw them taking all those pictures and just dumping them into the trash. Because there was nobody said, that's it, you're gone. You're gone. So God can't be like that with us. He's not gone except in spirit. I mean, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. He's not gone for us, but present to us somehow in spirit. We're humans. We have bodies. He gave us those bodies. And he wants to be present to us as a lover to his beloved in every way he can. So he is, because he can. The opposite of that, oh no, that's not really Jesus, is an untenable position to preach if you preach the love of God. It cannot be the case that it is anything other than Jesus Christ present because he so wills it to be. It's why Paul goes bananas if you eat the bread and drink the wine without discerning the body. You eat and drink your own damnation. You are guilty of the murder of the Lord because it is the Lord. It is the Lord. Dominus est. It is the Lord. And the whole reason the authority of the church exists is to keep that one truth present before us. It is the Lord. And from that one single truth, all the authority of the church derives and falls back on. The authority of the church to be able to ordain priests and make them, have them change ontologically in their being of who they are. They become other Christs, alter Christus, so that they may offer the sacrifice. The sacrifice that our Lord talks, uh, that God the Father talks about in the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verse 11. That from now on, a pure offering will be made. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the Gentiles. 
and a pure offering shall be made. There is no pure offering sinful human beings can offer to God other than God himself. It's why John the Baptist points at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He who will be sacrificed. And the sacrifice is meaningless. If you don't eat the sacrifice, you must eat the sacrifice or it does not count. He tells Moses, take a lamb into the, cut it up, eat the lamb, sacrifice the lamb, and eat the flesh. You must eat the sacrifice. Now our blessed Lord, who told that to Moses, comes 1,500 years later and says the same thing. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, for my, for my blood is real drink, and my flesh is real food. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I will raise him up on the last day. Everything surrounds that truth of the Eucharist, and that is what the authority of the church is there to hold up before us constantly, and everything that flows from around that, everything. Our Blessed Mother is the first monstrance because she contains within herself the actual body of Christ, just like a monstrance in a church does. She is the Ark of the Covenant because the old Ark of the Covenant contained within itself the manna from the desert that God gave them, the heavenly bread. This is the bread that came down from heaven contained in her. She is the Ark of the Covenant. Every single teaching of the church flows from and back onto the Eucharist, and that is what the authority of the church exists for, to maintain that one truth because all the other truths flow from it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To Thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To Thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious Advocate, Thine eyes of mercy towards us, and after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of Thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Sacred Heart of Jesus. Immaculate Heart of Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.